Thank you. Okay, so welcome everybody. How's the sound? Good? Um, I'll give you a little bit of uh, information about myself. Um, coming in on the plane this morning, I'm one of those strange people that I'm, I have no problem speaking to a large group, but I'm the guy in the back of the elevator, you know, the eyes are out, and if I'm uh, on an aeroplane, I, I sit with my looking down, trying not to make eye contact with anybody. And I don't know if it's because I'm like that, but generally people try and talk to me on the plane. And I'll say, <laughs> what is it that you do? And it's one of those things where I've had to try to find that over a period of time. And what I've been saying recently, I said it to your colleagues in Cape Town, I suppose what I do is I take people that are stressed, overworked, underpaid, and try and make them feel human again. And they all laugh and I said, you know, you, you don't need to go to Joker, there's not none of that over there. <laughs> so, you know, all of that sits over this concept of health. And no matter what I speak about, I start with the same question I'm going to ask of you. What is more important to you than your health? Really think about it. Or the health of the loved one. Nothing. The only answer I've ever accepted is the health of my child. Yes? Loved ones, yeah. Sometimes I ask, what's, my, what's your greatest asset? And everyone says, health, yes. You're probably, there's probably people in this room though that can think of a client that would rather have their money than their health, right? No. So, if that's our most important asset, what's our scorecard looking like? How are we doing? We are sicker than we've ever been in the history of humanity. As this is started off, 50% of us will develop heart disease at some point. 50%. And other 50% is going to be cancer, diabetes, or some obesity-related disorders. And then someone will say, yes, I, I get that, but isn't that because we're living longer? So because we're living longer, there's more chance of us getting diseases. Yes, you've heard that? What population group do you think these diseases are growing the fastest in? Children. So, who's heard of type 2 diabetes? When I was at university, we used to call that adult onset diabetes. And that was why? You got it as an adult. It was the one you got as an adult. So many children now have it that they had to change the name to type 2 diabetes. So it's not because we're living longer. Um, I'm going to hopefully convince you of what the cause of all that is now. Um, but what is the, what would you say, by the way, this is a discussion, so I'm going to ask lots of questions throughout. Please, someone break the ice. What do you think is the current model we're using of what causes chronic illness in healthcare? What causes people to be sick? Stress, very advanced answer. <laughs> but I'll tell you what the current model is. You got bad luck. You got bad genes. You chose the wrong parents. Or you got bad germs. So I remember when I was young, I used to go to the doctor and say, you know, why, why do I have this chronic sinusitis? You know, all year round, this blockage in my, my nose. Well, he'd say, does your father have sinusitis? And I'd say, yes. He'd say, well, it's genetic. Take his pills. And then I'd be in there later and I'd say, I've got these stomach cramps. Why do I have constant stomach cramps and bloating? And he'd say, well, does your father have those things? And I'd say, no, he doesn't. And I'd go, well, then you've got bad luck. Take his pills. <laughs> Let's look at the genes. I'm not going to go too much into this, but I'm often asked about it. Do genes play a role in your health? Absolutely. But is it as big as we think? No. Our genes haven't changed in 40,000 years. Well, let's leave 40,000 years, let's say of the last 100 years. Our genes haven't changed, would you agree? The rates of chronic illness have gone up every year for the last 70 years. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand if the genes are doing this, and the rate of illness per person is doing this, then there's something else going on, yes? Would you agree? Okay, good, good crowd. Okay. <laughs> genes haven't changed in 40,000 years, obesity's gone up 50% in 10 years. So there hasn't been enough time for our genes to suddenly get weaker, yes? Would you agree? Okay. So, who would have who would thought that a picture of a big fat yellow mouse might change your life? That big fat yellow mouse is called an Agouti mouse. And it's called that because it has a gene called the Agouti gene 
which makes it more prone to develop chronic illness, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, they also come out big, fat, and yellow, like us. Okay, now what's great about the Goody gene, the Goody mouse, is you can then test your drugs on the mouse because it has the same genetic predispositions like humans, yes? Okay, then one day a scientist said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to change the nutritional intake of this Goody mouse. What do you think happened? The big fat yellow mouse gave birth to a little brown mouse. And then that little brown mouse gave birth to another little brown mouse. So the gene was switched off just by changing one thing. Isn't that incredible? So the creature that was prone to the same illnesses that are killing all of us, they switched off that gene just by changing one thing. They gave rise to a whole field now called epigenetics. Epi above genetics it means that it's something above the genes that are controlling with us. We are single well. Okay. And that's not me talk, only talking about this. This is New England Journal of Medicine. That's one of the biggest medical journals in the world. 80% of illness is preventable. Chronic illness is preventable. This is Yale University. Your genes contribute only 25% to the length of your life. Why is this important? It means we have a huge amount of control. Yes? And after this talk, you're going to know what to do. Cool, that. Eh? Yeah. So, how do we get like this? Here's another question. Why is it that we have many smart people with lots of money trying to sort this out and we're not getting anywhere? What is the problem? Somehow, we separated ourselves from nature and the animal kingdom. Even when I was at university, we used to study biology as one subject and physiology is another one. We separated ourselves from nature. If I took a chimpanzee out of the wild and I strapped him to your desk and I told him it was useless all day and he ate a bucket of whatever, chicken, would he be sicker or healthier than he would be in the wild? Sicker. And if you walked in and you saw this poor chimpanzee getting sick, what did you do? You let him go. You would say to yourself what? Perhaps this environment is not what this chimpanzee was designed for. Perhaps this environment is stressful to this chimpanzee, so let's change the environment. And if he went back to his natural environment, you would expect what? His health to restore. Would you send him for blood tests first? Has anyone ever heard of an animal species in the wild getting sick and it being blamed on genetics? Huh? Then that's weird. We've separated ourselves. So we say, no honey, don't give the packet of chips and the soda to the dog. It's bad for the dog. That's for you and your friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to use an analogy with how crazy this gets. In, in Canada, they've got the Great Lakes. And in the 70s, there was a huge ecological disaster there where all the fish were getting sick. And the birds were getting sick, and it was a massive ecological disaster. What do you think would have happened if I stood in front of a zoology conference and I said, the problem is clearly genetic for these fish. So we're going to build tiny little fishy hospitals around the lakes, and we're going to create tiny little fishy drugs, and we're going to dump it into the lake. And then they gave me a trillion dollars, and I said, fantastic. And I came back the next year, and they said, well, we gave you a trillion dollars. How's it going? Well, the fish are sicker than they've ever been. Okay, let's give you another trillion dollars. And the next year, what did I say? What would I say? The fish are sicker than they've ever been. You see why I wake up a little bit annoyed every morning? Yeah, so what is health? This is the first question that I'm going to actually ask, get an answer from you. What do we define as health? And let's start with this. How would you know if I was healthy? What would you base it on? Yeah, so what I look like, basically, yes. What about how would you base, if you are healthy, what do you base that on? How you feel. So would everyone agree that we base our health on how we look or how we feel? Wrong. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to prove it to you. That over there is a scan of someone's heart. That big white blotch is a blockage to one of his arteries, feeding the heart with uh, oxygenated blood. So that particular person has heart disease. He has no chest pain. No shortness of breath, no arm pain, never had a sick day in his life. 
and one day drops on the golf course. Who's heard of someone that that's happened to? There's no symptoms. He's sick or is he well? He's sick. There's no symptoms. Let me ask you on the uh, other side of the spectrum. I eat a toxic food. After a while, I start feeling nauseous. An hour later, I'm hugging the toilet bowl vomiting. Do I look good? Do I feel good? But is that a healthy function or a sick function of the body? You see, I use the word there, function. In this case, the nervous system picks up that there's a toxin in the body and it expels that toxin. It's incredibly intelligent, but I don't look good and I don't feel good. Why is this important? If we base our health on how we look or how we feel, we're only going to do something if we look bad or feel bad, yes? If we artificially suppress symptoms, we might mistakenly feel that we become healthier, which is not always the case. Would you agree? And a point about that, I'm going to come to it later. Okay, stick well. I'm going to redefine health for you, and I'm going to tell you first when you start looking at the body a little differently. We think of ourselves as bits and pieces, but I can tell you we're not. We're an ecosystem of cells. And let's use an example of another ecosystem. Um, let's talk about a rainforest, made up of millions of trees, yes? Would you agree that if you've got a rainforest of a million trees and all those trees are healthy, then the rainforest is healthy, yes? Same thing with the human body. We made up of cells, 75 trillion of them. That number gets thrown around a lot. How, we're in a bank, how long would it take you to count a trillion dollars? One, two, three, four. <laughs> The cashiers. <laughs> no cashiers here. <laughs> 3,000 years to count 1 trillion. We've got 75 trillion cells. Does it sound complex? In each cell, there's about 10 million chemical reactions per second constantly going without you thinking about it or being controlled by one thing, which we're going to talk about a bit later. So, the new definition of health is when all or most of your cells are functioning as they should, at near 100%. Yes, you with me? Okay, so what's the definition of sickness? Irrespective of what your diagnosis is, it means that some or all of your cells <coughs> are functioning in a state of stress rather than a state of health. Why is this important? If we can figure out what causes your cells, because I'll tell you, you're all designed to have cells that are well. If we can figure out what causes that, we figured out the root cause of all chronic illness and then we can fix it. Yes? Guess what? I know already. There's only two causes for that. Okay, you want to have an idea? There are two causes for all chronic illness. High blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, heart disease. Exercise and Stress falls part of it. Nutrition falls part of it. You're either toxic in something you don't need, or you're deficient in something you do. That's how simple it is. You have too much of something coming into your body, or you have too little of something that you require. In terms of how you eat, how you move, and how you think. We'll bring this all together in a little bit. Okay, so, let's put it on the scale. This is zero. My cells are dead. Over here, is 10 out of 10, they're expressing full health, full vitality, and I'm sitting at 6. Yes? So I'm toxic in something, deficient in something, or both. For me, 6 out of 10 means that I'm tired all the time, I have headaches, I have low back pain, um, and I have anxiety. Sound familiar? Okay, so I'm sitting at 6 out of 10. I want to get to 10, yes? Which one will get me there, a drug or a surgery? Can a drug make you feel better? Can a drug save your life in times of emergency? Thank God we have it. But is it possible to take a toxic and deficient individual and drive them towards homeostasis with those two tools? Possible. Irrespective of how much money you throw at the problem. You can throw as much money as you want. If you're not fixing toxicity and deficiency, you cannot drive an individual in that direction. Can you see where the problem lies? So, in a little bit later, we're going to talk about what is toxic and deficient, or what are the things you can do to correct that. In the way you're eating, the way you're moving, and the way you think. Health is so simple, that's why animals are healthier than us. They just follow certain laws. 
Yes? Yeah. Body just wants to stress. One of the things I try and get across to everybody who will listen is to try and get across how intelligent your body is and how it never makes mistakes. And we use a couple of examples. <clears throat> One being, what would happen if I threw you naked on an iceberg? So the picture is coming up. Right? <laughs> you shiver, yes? So your nervous system <coughs> would pick up that the temperature was cold and you would shiver. Why is that clever? Bring your body temperature up. Next thing that happens, all the blood from your arms and your legs go away from your arms and your legs towards here. Why would that happen? To your vital organs. But does that feel healthy? Ask the foot that falls. It's not healthy. It doesn't feel healthy. But is it intelligent? You see, your body under stress will do anything to buy you time to change the environment you're in. It'll do anything. It'll cause you to lose a foot if it just gives you more time to get off the iceberg. Does that make sense? And then what happens? You either get off the iceberg or you die. So that the nervous system can stop all those things. Let's use another example. I am drinking water out of a babbling book. This is in Joburg, not in Cape Town. <laughs> and suddenly a lion jumps out behind the bush. I will release a hormone called, what's a stress hormone called? Cortisol. So cortisol gets released and it has a couple of effects. One of them is that your blood sugar will go up. So you'll have a lot of energy in your blood. Stupid or clever? Clever. Platelets go up. They're very important for um, healing wounds and make your blood sticky. Stupid or clever in times of emergency. Okay, LDL cholesterol goes up. Who's heard of the bad cholesterol? LDL. No such thing. If you didn't have LDL cholesterol, you would die. Okay. The LDL cholesterol is very important for wound healing as well. And also it's used as a raw material to create more stress hormone, should you need it. Okay. We start craving sugar, increase heart rate, increase blood pressure. Why would your heart rate and your blood pressure go up? It circulates the stress hormone and it gets blood supply to the muscles. Should you have to fight or run? Fight or fight. Yes? Anything? No mistake yet. Genetic error or bad luck? No. Decreased immunity. Why would the body move energy away from your immune system? When you're sick, do you feel like you're energized or do you feel tired? Tired. Reason being your immune system is very energy sapping. So when you're running away from a tiger, would you rather get away or fight the flu bug? <laughs> so what the body does in its infinite intelligence is it takes energy away from your immune system to other things. Now in the short term, can anyone disagree with me? that all of that is intelligent response to stress in the short term. In the long term, how does that sound for heart disease, stroke, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, cholesterol profile, LDL going up, HDL going down. How does that sound for that? Is it bad luck? Or is it perhaps that our environment is different to what our bodies were adapted to live? Here's the good news. You don't have to wear a loincloth and run around in Africa to be in a good environment. You can live in the modern world, you can be in the corporate sector, you can do all of these things and you can still flourish just by making certain changes and making it a bit sure. That sound good? Okay. Okay, let's talk about this. This should sound familiar. This has a point, I think. Yeah. So, the journey. We start here. We're born here. This is the level of health that we should have our whole lives in this band. When we're subjected to stress, our function drops, yes? But our bodies have resilience, so we adapt and we cope and we go back up. And then we have more stress, but we cope. We have more stress, but we cope. That's what should happen our whole lives, yes? However, if that overwhelms that over a long, long period of time, we go down, but we don't have the ability to go back up. So it becomes the new normal, the new normal, the new normal, without any symptoms. And then suddenly we cross there, 
where we have a symptom. And let's use tension headaches as an example. So we wait a bit longer until the tension headaches are so bad it's stopping us from being able to function. And then what do we do? We treat the symptom. It doesn't matter what it is, is it a drug, if it's a massage, if it's a chiropractor, it doesn't matter. We treat the symptom until we get to here where we start feeling okay. And then we have another crash, yes? Then we treat it again. Then we have another crash. And then maybe this time we need stronger treatment. We've got to go to somebody to get a stronger treatment. If you're in your office and you say, especially in the open environment, you say, who's got a headache tablet? How quickly is someone going to give you a headache tablet? Because everyone has them, yes? Because everybody's going through the cycle. Oh, that's what I wanted to say earlier. Going back to this um, 0 to 10 scale, toxic and deficient, are headaches caused by a deficiency of paracetamol? <laughs> <laughs> so, with the model we use, is we set ourselves, the body's designed to do well, if you're going down this scale, you're either toxic or deficient in the way you're eating, moving, and thinking. How can we get this person back to there, which is no symptoms, but then back up to there because that is where your true expression of health is? Is everyone with me so far? Okay. Well, this is a symptom base. This is the part of the talk where I say I'm not anti medicine. Sometimes I hope that I come across like that, but I might. And I'm going to show you how we need both. Now, I'm going to call the wellness industry. The, fire, the, the handyman, and I'm going to call the medical industry the fire department. Now, who do you call when your house is on fire? Fire department. And the fire department has two tools. They have axes and they have hose pipes. And if you call them, they'll come in, they'll smash the door down, they'll spray everything. They might cause a little bit of damage. But if they get there on time, they may save your house. And we must be eternally grateful that we have the fire department. Yes. Would you call the fire department back the next day to rebuild your house with an axe and a hose pipe? What about calling them the day before with an axe and a hose pipe and saying, do so? Does it mean the person doesn't want the best for you? Does it mean they don't know what they're doing? Or is it maybe just the wrong tool for the job required? So the wellness industry, if it's done properly, which it very rarely is, that is a handyman. And what a handyman does is he comes into this toolbox belt and he says, you know what, we've got some wires hanging from there, I don't like it, I think we must patch it up. And you'll say what, but there's no fires, why should I do that? No, I want that to be patched up. If the fire starts, he takes a step back, because he'll look a bit stupid with his toolbox. But once that fire is put out, if it's put out, he can come back in and say, okay, what a mess, how do we restore this house back to its former glory? Does that all make sense? When this guy tries to do this guy's job, it gets dangerous and expensive. And when this guy tries to do this guy's job, it also gets dangerous and expensive. So but when used correctly and we ask ourselves, what do we need? Do we need a wellness intervention? Do we need a medical intervention? And we can choose which way we go based on what our goals are. Yes? Yeah, right. Solution. So what's the solution? You should know now. Three things. You've got to eat well, you've got to move well, and you've got to think well, based on what your genome requires, not what we've created. Now, I do seminars on each one, everywhere from an hour to a weekend on each one, but I'm going to save you some time, and I'm going to give you some very simple laws to follow in all three categories. Does that sound good? In three minutes. Okay, so, eat well. <coughs> when you look at a food, you try to figure out whether it's good or bad, was it made by nature or was it made by a factory? Very simple. Which one's better? Oh, see, you guys miss that. Don't overeat. It's the one I struggle with. As South Africans, we tend to eat a lot. Because we're told when we're young, you better finish that plate, otherwise you're not getting up. Yes? So eat till you're about 70-80% full. Yeah, eat when you're hungry. Lots of colors, textures, and flavors. So eat food from nature and get as many colors, textures, and flavors as you can. And chew your food. I eat. Just... Lots and lots of plants. As much plants as you can handle. Grandmother test. If your grandmother doesn't recognize the food, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> Ingredients. If you need a PhD in biochemistry, 
to read the ingredients. That's probably not a good idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bad day, it's okay. If you have a bad day when you're eating toxic food, if you have a bad week when you eat toxic food, if you have a bad month that you're eating toxic food, it's okay. You know what the problem is? Is that people think of health or wellness as being an all or nothing thing. If I had to ask you of one thing you could do today that would make you healthier, could you think of that one thing? But a lot of you won't do that because you won't do the healthy stuff because you don't want to give up pizza and beer. It's all or nothing. Does that make sense? The only thing that's all or nothing is pregnancy. <laughs> and death, maybe. But it's a con constant continuum. I go off the path all the time. But then what you do is you say, oh well, that was great, that wasn't so great, but let's go back on the continuum. Yes? Always judge a food by how you feel afterwards, not during. Have you ever heard someone say, oh, I shouldn't have had that last salad? <laughs> <laughs> Judge a food by how you feel afterwards, not during. Okay, move well. Always be moving. Take every chance you get to move in some way. Don't circle the parking lot at the gym for two hours if you're the closest park. Actually, look for excuses to move more. Walk as much as you can. Take the stairs as much as you can. Park as far as you can. far as you can from the place that you're going. Heart rate up, out of breath. A couple of times a week, get your heart rate up. Whatever it is, get to that up stage. Flexibility. Always work on your flexibility, especially of the spine. We're going to discuss that at the end. There's an old saying, I think it comes from yoga, where they say you're as old as your spine is flexible. Okay. Get up from your desk every 30 minutes. I, I do a lot of um, talks on, on ergonomics in the corporate sector to get people to use the furniture properly. Because otherwise, if it's not used properly, it's a complete waste of money. I've seen it many times. And that thing there of getting up every 30 minutes, I don't care if you have a hundred thousand rand chair. If you're not getting up every 30 minutes, it's damaging your spine and it's damaging your brain. I'm going to prove to that to you a little bit later. So get up every 30 minutes from your sitting position. Play. I don't like the word exercise because to me, exercise, I think of a treadmill, smelling chlorine, watching e news. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't have to be like that. It can be any movement. It can be a hobby. It can be a sport. Just get outside and do something that you enjoy. Take your shoes off and touch the earth with your bare feet. <gasps> when my children walk around with bare feet and it's cold, everyone comes up to them and says, you know they're going to catch their death. It's so cold. And I always say to them, why do the people in Siberia not have colds all the time? Yeah. Think well. Morning ritual, something I've, I've kind of found in the last year or two, which makes a huge difference. How I used to wake up is I used to wake up with a toddler lying across my face. <laughs> and then as I'd, I'd be in bed right to the last minute, before that I have to get out, then with my one eye, I'd look at my phone and I'd check News 24. See that there's a train crash in Siberia that killed 100 people. Oh, first thing, man. Okay, great. Next thing, I'd look on Facebook. Is that a great way to start your day? You see, when you sleep, it's a momentum breaker. Your thoughts stop, your conscious thoughts. My relationships, how is it affecting my work? How is it affecting my family if I stay the same? What will happen if in time, if I stay the same? And you've got to take yourself into that pit a little bit. And then you reach that leverage point, and suddenly you have internal inspiration rather than external motivation. Everyone with me? Okay, then you make those changes Condition that pattern over 30 days, and you'll see how easy it gets after that. Okay. okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this because, <coughs> excuse me, because of the desk work. Who sits at a desk six to eight hours a day? Everyone put up your hand. Yes. Now, why is that so important? When you sit at a desk too long, it starts to damage your spine, and your spine protects something. What does it protect? Your nervous system. What does your nervous system do? It controls your entire life. Every organ you have, every hormone you produce, every thought you have, the way you spin a golf club, the way you cognitively figure out a solution to a problem, 
is all based on how well <coughs> your nervous system is working. Does it sound important? Yes. Okay, so let's go past this. That nervous system is so important, it's protected by the spine, and your spinal joints have an intimate relationship with those nerves. In other words, when the joints move, the nerves fire, and it charges your brain like a battery. So we are all self-charging entities. When we move the spine, our brains charge. Everyone with me? I'll prove it to you. If you sit at a desk for eight hours without getting up, at the end, do you feel well rested and just ready to take on the next project? Or do you feel like junk? When you don't move, your brain becomes deficient in its most important nutrient, which is movement of the spine. It's called proprioception. Let's look at this. So, when those joints move, it fires information up to the brain. The brain takes that information and it uses it to control the body and it charges the brain up like a battery. So, if those joints get stiff, if those joints get damaged, if those joints get stuck, what's going to happen? Your brain gets deficient in something that it needs and you start releasing a hormone in the body. What hormone do you think? Cortisol. So why am I saying this? No matter what else you do in your lifestyle, if the way you are sitting, or you're sitting too long is incorrect, or if your spine is unhealthy, you are releasing cortisol anyway. And it's the most misunderstood and the most ignored part of health, the fact that your spine affects your brain. Are you with me? Yes, okay. Let's go past that, go past that. I want to, yeah, this is Roger Sperry, PhD. He won the Nobel Prize for Brain Research. He said that 90% of the energy output of the brain is used to relating itself to gravity. What he meant by that is, most of the energy your brain uses is to keep you upright against gravity, otherwise you would fall over. Crazy, eh? Only 10% is for thinking, metabolism, and everything else. So, if you're supposed to be like this, but now because of years of desk work, you're like this, does the brain have to work more hard or less hard to keep you up? Harder. Which means it has less energy for what? Thinking, metabolism, even. So when the spine becomes unhealthy, the brain becomes less efficient at doing its other jobs. Everyone with me? Yes. Okay. Yes, no, that. This is to show you what the future is of spinal care. It's a little handheld device. So when the spine is detected to be stiff in certain areas, we use the device to restore the motion in the joints. It sends impulses up to the brain, restores that function, and the posture begins to unwind. In fact, we do this in corporate buildings. Okay. This is Lady Heidi Harvick. What her research showed is when those joints are restored, when the movement is restored, it improves the brain's processing of information, it improves muscular strength, and it increases the activity in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. Why is that important? What happens at the prefrontal cortex? Cognitive thinking, decision making. It's the executive part of your brain. So why is that important? If you're sitting too long and damaging your spine, your prefrontal cortex is not getting nutrition, and you're going to be less good at what? Thinking. You've probably felt that brain fog after sitting for too long. Who's had that? Doesn't something doesn't feel right? That's showing that your spinal joints are not feeding the brain with proper information. Thomas Edison, the doctor of the future, will give no medicine that will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the prevention of disease. I like this one, this is from an economist, uh, Professor Paul Pilsen, they said, the sickness business is reactive. Despite its enormous size, people become customers only when they are stricken by and react to specific condition. The wellness business is proactive. People voluntarily become customers to feel healthier, reduce aging, and avoid becoming customers of the sickness business. So wellness is proactive. You do things, who's heard of, oh, you're pregnant now, you're so lucky, you can eat whatever you want. Or well, you're so lucky, you're skinny, you never have to exercise. Why is that? Because people are basing their health on how they look and how they feel. So therefore they will make choices based on that. Rather than saying, I will voluntarily go for a run because I understand that my genes require it. Does that make sense? And I want to end off on this. You have a practitioner trained in this model, and you have a practitioner trained in the allopathic model. Mrs. Jones walks in. And Mrs. Jones has high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and she's overweight. The first practitioner will say, Mrs. Jones, you have a family history of high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So what we're going to do is put you on a medication to control it. 
You're going to have to take that for the rest of your life. Thank you very much. I'll see you in three months' time. And she walks out. Yes? The same Mrs. Jones walks into someone training this paradigm. Someone says, Mrs. Jones, you are designed to express health just like everybody else. The fact that your body is increasing the blood pressure and cholesterol is a sign that it's adapting to toxicity and deficiency in your lifestyle. What we're going to do is assess how you eat, move, and think, and we're going to teach you how to restore that back to balance. Is there a difference? Okay, this is how big <coughs> this stuff is. Okay, I'm going to end off there. Any questions? Yes? Yes. What is your opinion on like, like, the experience of the plant-based diet? That's a good question, and I want to talk a little bit about this. You can leave if you want, by the way. Um, the question was plants. I talk about plants. What, I'm, what do I mean by that? And, and there's all these crazes in nutrition. You know, no thing. Someone comes to me and says, I'm on banting, I'm on this, I'm on that, and I'm allowed to eat this, I'm allowed to have teaspoon of mayonnaise of my tuna, you know, I'm allowed to do this. I always think to myself, who is this outside person that has responsibility over you? Who is this external force that says you're allowed to do this and this? Can you see, we are taking accountability away from ourselves. We're putting it into someone else's hands. So, when I say plants, fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, and all of that. Low carb, we definitely eat too many carbs in general in the Western world. Also, our source of carbs is not all real carbs. It's processed stuff. So that must be taken into account. The whole ultra-low carb is not for everybody. For some people, not for everybody. Is it sustainable for most people? Probably not. But no matter what you do, plants, plants, plants. Can you be healthy being vegetarian? Yes. Can you be healthy being vegan? Yes. Just got to make sure that you're getting all the nutrients you need. Have we been eating meat for the last hundred thousand years? Yes. Was that meat very different to what you buy at the grocery store now? Yes. So it's not just cut and dry. We've got to look at this stuff logically. And then once you make your choices, you educate yourself about where this food's coming from. So no matter what you do, eat lots of plants. Yes. Sleep vital. Yes. Six to eight hours. As soon as you are not sleeping, your insulin resistance goes up, which changes your blood sugar profile. So sleep is another pillar. Yeah, so sleep hygiene is something to look up. Anything else? It's, it's very simple. It's basically going away from the processed stuff. So the wheats, the sugars, the refined stuff going more towards whole natural foods. You can go more in depth than that, and especially in functional medicine, they tend to. Um, yeah, but um, I, I tend to just, as soon as you go towards food in its natural state, it becomes anti-inflammatory all of In some cases, I will go more detailed than that, but again, I'm all about sustainability, so I would only do it in certain cases. Yes? Is it your homeopathy? Homeopathy. Homeopathy, acupuncture, all these things. The thing about it is it's based on energetic flow. Do I believe it exists? Yes. Is it possible to define it with scientific measurements that we currently have? No. So we are always going to have an issue with the scientific community and things like that, homeopathy, acupuncture. But does it damage people? No. It's extremely safe. Has it helped people for hundreds of years? Yes. So I'm happy with it. But anything that's energy driven, it's going to be very difficult to scientifically prove it for now. Maybe in the future we will. I would put that the same as acupuncture. Yeah. Sorry, say again. Because we're very good at keeping sick people alive. The question is are they healthy and are they functional? That's the question. No. If you take a hunter gatherer that lives into old age, and a lot of them did, what does a, a chief of a Native American Indian tribe look like to you, in your mind? Is he like this? No, he stands up straight, he's got good muscle tone, he leads the community. And they lived as old as we live. 
And we say the same for the Western world. So, we are living longer. A lot of it's because of medicine, yes, better hygiene, better sanitation, all these things. But my question is about how functional and how healthy we are. Are we keeping sick people alive, or are we living into old age, vibrant and healthy as we're designed to be? Yes? So, which people are plants? So, my son how good are you just got to clean it as much as you can. And if you're practical, buy organic. And if you're not buying organic, just clean it. Look, there's a lot of toxins we can't get away. And it's, it, the, the good news is the body can deal with a lot. But just do the best that you can by washing those and going organic. Yes? Yes, let's talk about it. You want to know about vitamin supplements. Okay, the supplement companies want to make money just like a pharmaceutical company. Okay, so with supplements, I look at foundation and I ask two questions. Number one, is this nutrient essential for human health? Number one, and is it possible to get it from our diet? If the nutrient is essential for human health and it's very difficult or impossible to get it from our diet, then our supplement. Is it with me? So what falls in that category? Omega-3 fish oil. We see wild game, things like that, with tons of omega-3, we don't do that anymore. Probiotic bacteria. We used to pull stuff out the ground and eat sand, and we were full of this healthy bacteria. Now, because of processed foods, medications, our bacterial biome is horrendous. So I always talk about a probiotic. <coughs> Vitamin D. For certain people, especially office workers that aren't out in the sun. Um, and then a multi-nutrient. Multi-nutrient is not the meal and end it's the cherry on the top. Because our foods probably don't have the nutritional content that they used to have. <coughs> so I would say that is my foundation. Mega 3 probiotic, vitamin D3, and a multi-nutrient in its food state is what I would do. Okay. Anything else? Done. Okay, thanks for listening, guys.